in my title today, Out of Egypt. All right, Out of Egypt. So today I'm going to wrap up our series on heaven. I'm going to wrap up our comments on Egypt, and I'm going to introduce our next series. How's that? Can you guys hang in with me? All right. All right. So we're good, right? <laughs> so, um, and I guess, isn't it interesting how when we start finding things, that things just kind of come to you, right? So we got back from, you know, and it was really interesting to be in Egypt after our, serv our series in e on um, the Exodus that we did last fall. And so it was cool to be where all of these things happened. Um, and it's very, very cool. And we, and we each have different perspectives on things, and so I wanted to share with you also some of the things that I got out of our visit there, because I, when, he's, when Pastor Martin shared last week, you know what? The Bible comes alive. It came alive when we go to Israel. It comes alive in Egypt, because God is real. Amen. And he has been working in our world for a long time, right? And it is really cool to be there. And, and so I want to share with you some of those um, perspectives, but it's interesting to me how things just start coming up, right? So the day after we get back from Egypt, I was doing an open house, as y'all know, we're real estate agents on the side, right? And, um, and so we're there, and in, in walks somebody into the open house, and they're talking in this foreign language, and i got to tell you, if Pastor Martin had been there, he would have known right away that it was Arabic, right? But not me. <laughs> So uh, I almost broke out Siri to go, okay, what is this, right? But I was dressed like you are today because I happened to be there. And, um, and so she walks up to me, this woman, and she says, it was a husband and a wife, and she walks up to me and she says, have you been to Egypt? <laughs> and I said, as a matter of fact, I just got back. And she's like, oh, anyway, we were, they were so excited, right? And so I said, oh, I love your country. I wanted to know where they were from there. She was actually from Aswan, which we were not able to go to. So we're like, we got to go back. So we go to Aswan and take a um, tour down the aisle, a cruise down the aisle, and we want to go to the Red Sea as well. But we saw a tremendous amount of things, and it was an awesome, awesome time. And then we went to convention, right? And all you got to hear is we had a great time at convention. But we look around, and, and everywhere we look, because they, they the, the resort we were at, they all wear name tags of where they're from. And guess where everybody was from? Egypt. Egypt. You guys are so smart. All right? And so literally, we found out that 250 workers of that hotel and resort were from Egypt. Is that not crazy? <laughs> All right, so we wanted to showcase for you Egypt. We want to, uh, part of what I'm going to do today, too, is share with you what um, Foursquare is doing in Egypt. And every month, we're going to be bringing you a place um, to showcase a place in the, in the world to be praying for, or something that uh, Foursquare is doing, so we're going to be showcasing those things as well. Are you guys excited about that? All right. And so, now I can see the next one. Can you do that one for me, Crystal? Thank you. So they, <laughs> you have to have all these things. They have us one jumping over the pyramids and all these things. So they do all these crazy poses. So you know what? Because they have a sense of humor there. And so they were fun. So we didn't do this. They're like, hey, you got to do this. We don't even know what they're doing. They're like, do like this. Do like this. <laughs> Jump. <laughs> Run around. And, and, um, but there we are. So there with the pyramids. And so those have been there for thousands and thousands of years. Did y'all know that Egypt predates Israel? That's not because it predate where God is working. Amen. But the, but the country and there's been a civilization, and, and it, it's all of those things, so it's right there, and they have a, um, a whole thing. So I want to give you just a couple, if you go to the next slide, just a couple stats so you know where we're at, because welcome to Egypt, right? So I'm either Cleopatra today, or I'm Alexandra from Alexandria, I don't know, you take your pick, all right? But I want you to know that Egypt is mentioned more times than any other place in the Bible except for Israel. Do you think maybe God has a heart for Egypt, right? And Egypt is older than Israel, I told you that. Um, and, and by the way, I think as we go through, you're going to find, you know, when we talked about it in Exodus and about how the, the plagues, and God was really trying to show himself great in Egypt because they were a, um, a polytheistic nation. They believed that um, there was many gods, and he wanted to show them that God of the universe is the greatest God, that there is no other God but him, that there is but one God, and that he is the most all-powerful God because he wanted... Egypt to come to know him. Amen? Amen? So 95% of the population lives in 5% of the land. Can you imagine? 
5% of the land is right up and down the Nile because so that's where it's fertile, all right? There's 91.2 million people at last count. I'm sure it's grown since then, but that's what I got. And there's 12% uh, there's Christian people. Most of those are Coptic Christians. Um, the rest are Muslim, all right? Um, tradition says that the apostle, some people believe that the apostle Mark is the one that brought Christianity to Egypt. And, e and Egypt embraced Christianity very quickly. Amen. And I believe that's because they had a heart for spirituality, for God. They just didn't know who was the right God. Amen. They didn't know who to follow. Good morning. And so, um, and basically, he said he brought that there in AD 33. Can you imagine how incredibly close that was to the time of Christ? Right? It was there very quickly. Um, and like Jerusalem, Antioch and Rome, Alexandria was a leading center of early Christian thought. Um, and I, I, I didn't know this, actually. I found this out not too long ago. The School of Alexandria was the first Christian institution of higher learning, founded in the mid-century AD. I know I like my city, right? And then <laughs> it's got a library, got a Christian a learning, leading um, center, uh, institution of higher learning. Is that not cool? Right? All in Egypt. Um, and in 380 AD, Christianity became the official religion. Isn't that cool? All right, of course, it's now a predominantly Muslim, but at the time, because God has been at work in the nations, because he wants to reach every tribe, every nation, in every language, right? Amen. And then, the next one for me. So that, um, one thing I think that was really cool, that, uh, as Pastor Martin shared last week about we don't have a blind faith. We can trust the Bible. There's proof that the Bible exists. Now, I'm going to tell you that these are our guides, all right, in the different various areas that we went to. All of them are not our faith. So guess what they are, right? <laughs> they are the predominant faith of Egypt, right? And as they're going along, they start telling us stories. Because they're here to tell us the history. Okay? They're supposed to be telling us facts. They've gone to school. They've gone to, they, go to, they get a history major, right? And then they go and they go to the tourism and they teach us. And so they're going through and they're telling us. And they said, well, you know, there was this baby boy named Moses and they put him in the Nile. And then he delivered then the slaves and they did this and they did that. And they, there was these slaves. And, and I'm like, wait, I, I know that story. <laughs> right? I know that story. We said, wait, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. Talking about Moses? He goes, oh, yeah, 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 talking about Moses. And like, so we said, so is Moses a real person to you? Absolutely. Well, do you believe that that's a fact? Or is that like a myth? Or is that like just your faith? They're like, it is absolute fact. It's in history. It's in the Bible. It's in the Quran. This is, this is true. We're like, okay then. <laughs> So they're going along, and then they start telling the story about Joseph, and they said, you know, they, they were stored up all this grain because there was a great famine in the land of Egypt. And they said, well, hold on, hold on. Do you believe that that's a real story? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolute fact. It's not like a belief. No, no, no. This, it's fact. We have evidence for these things. Is that not cool? Going through, and they start talking about the Exodus and the Red Sea, and we're like, hold on, hold on. Do you believe that too? And they're like, absolutely. I think that by this time they're thinking we're crazy. Who are these people? They don't have anything that's fact, right? And, and we actually do. But, I mean, but And by the way, they did not know that we were Christian at this point. We eventually got there, right? But it, with those things, because it was each of these things, we hadn't got to that part of the conversation yet. So they were not trying to please us, right? They're just there. And, so, and then they start telling us that in 2004, 2006, I'm not sure of the date, that they actually found, I can't remember what they found, but they found evidence of the army drowning in the Red Sea. And it's interesting because, you know, here we get, we grow past God sometimes. We get so intellectual. By the way, there's nothing wrong with being intellectual and learning things. I love to learn. I'm a researcher. You know what I mean? Welcome. And so um, it's great. And, um, uh, but sometimes we get so intellectual that we forget God. And then we start doubting things. And you know what? I think that part of our problem, like he was sharing, Esther was sharing, Pastor Martin was sharing just a little bit ago, is that part of the issue here is that we've intellectualized so many things that we, never, we don't leave room for God to work spiritually. Because it's got to make sense to our minds. Okay, and remember, this, this civilization was thousands of years old. And so when things don't match up into your Bible, don't despair, because they're finding new things every day that back us up. 
Like, before 2004, 2006, I remember the time when they were like, well, we don't have any proof for the Red Sea, crossing of the Red Sea. There's no proof. If that happened, how come there's not all this stuff? Well, in 2004, 2006, whatever it was, they found it. Right? So have they. And they said they are earthing things every day. Is that not the coolest? Um, and so pray for these guys. They were awesome guides for us. But it, it really struck us. It's like, oh my goodness, they have more faith than we do sometimes. I've heard, I don't know, do you think God really drowned them in, that, that, that really happened? They really drowned in the Red Sea? Yeah, because the Bible said. And the Bible's more true than we know. And that is a reality, all right? And then, so one of the things that was really big, so I've already told you that the Egyptians were um, polytheists, right? So they really believed that there was a multitude of gods and they had these fights. They believed that Pharaoh was gonna become God. They also kind of, at one point, believed that he, that he was the son of God. Doesn't that sound a little interesting? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of funny how there's something inside of us that seeks and yearns for God. We know there's something more real than what we've got. We just mess it up, right? Anyway, and so what they did is they truly focused on the afterlife. They're very, very focused. Like their whole society was focused on the afterlife. And they put all that efforts. In fact, our guides, all the guides said, you, have you noticed that we found pyramids? We found tombs. We found coffins. We found, um, what is it? I can't say that word. Say it again. So there you go. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> all right, they found all these things, and they're all related to the afterlife. You know what they haven't found yet? Like houses <laughs> and stores. Now, we know they were there, okay? Um, and there was stuff like that. But the reason they found all this other stuff is because they built them to last, because they live their life today in view of the future in view of when they were going to die. They believe so strongly in the afterlife that they put all of their preparation in there. And so they were trying to preserve whatever they needed because they knew that there was something beyond this life. Now, they got it wrong, right? Because they thought that they could take all this stuff. Right? Actually, you can go to the next slide from here. So they, they tried to preserve things. And so there's a mummy. And so they would, they would like wrap them in with cloth and they would treat them. And then they would put them in a coffin or, and then they would just keep like Russian dolls, you guys seen Russian dolls where there's a little thing and it's bigger and bigger? Well, they would do that because they didn't want it to deteriorate, all right? And so, because they, they really, but one of, part of their beliefs is that you had to have a body. They wanted your, that body to survive so they could be in the afterlife. Let me give you hope. If something happens, you know a loved one that's been cremated or they died in a fire, it's okay. <laughs> you're still gonna go to heaven. If you're a Christian, you're still gonna go to heaven. God is still there, right? You're still raised from the dead. We don't need that. But that is what their belief was, okay? So they were doing all these things. And the sad thing is, as, as he shared last week, is that with all of their stuff, their, their tombs were robbed, their, the pyramids were robbed, and they ended up not all surviving. But that was their hope, right? If you can go to the next slide for me. And then they have this canop, uh, canopic jars. And I, I didn't have like an actual picture, so if you look way down here, there's these little jars. Well, those little jars are the organs that they took from um, the body to preserve them because they believed that they would need those organs um, in the afterlife, right? So, um, can you imagine? <laughs> Go to the next slide, please. And they would put them in this, a box like this. So they found this box, and then if, I don't have pictures of that, if you open it, there's like rows of them in the museum. And if you open up that box, there's another box. If you open up that box, there's another box. I'm like... Maybe they and the Russians colluded, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I'm kidding. But there, was, but there was box after box after box until there was a little box and then those canopic jars to keep them safe and to preserve them. Pretty crazy, right? Um, the next slide for me. And then in the pyramids and stuff, what they found are things for life. So they would put in the chairs. They would put in boats so they could travel. They put in games, believe it or not. Whatever they felt like they needed, they put in their pets. Servants. <laughs> okay, because they felt that they were going to need all of these things in the afterlife. And so that's what they did. Um, and then the next one, they would, put, they would get a sphinx, and they would go, that sphinx was supposed to guard all of those things. Now, as we know, it didn't really do such a great job because the tombs were robbed, the pyramids were robbed, but that was <laughs> what they were attempting to do, is to guard all of that, to preserve it so that they could live 
in the afterlife. All right? And then you're going to say, well, why, why do they believe so strongly in afterlife? Like, we see some of this in different um, civilizations, but they were so strong, so strong that they were just pushing forward. So what is it? If you go to the next one. And they said, our guides told us, no, Egyptians are very spiritual, and what they saw is they watched the sun. They watched the sun rise, and they would watch the sun set. And then the next day it would rise up. And they said, if the sun comes back, and if the sun rises, gives them birth, and then dies at night and comes back, there's got to be an afterlife. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Amen? So, it's, um, and you know, and the Bible tells us that God has given us signs so that we might know. Amen? Amen? Amen. So if you're worried about people that have not been, got, that has not reached for Jesus, let me just tell you that Jesus is on the road, right? He's on the path for that. If you go to the next one. It's Romans 1, 19 through 20. The New Living Translation says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to him. Did you hear that? Obvious. It's obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Isn't that not cool? Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities. We see his majesty and his might, right? With the mountains and the oceans, the stars in the heaven, the sun and the moon. What an awesome God we serve. His eternal power and his divine nature. We see his goodness, right? So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Because he has placed in our hearts a yearning for him. And he has placed things in the earth. And so even with his little, they didn't have a Bible then. And I admit they messed it up, but they figured out there was an afterlife because they watched the heavens. Because God is after people. And he does everything in his power to show you the way. Amen? In the next scripture, it's Psalm 19, 1 through 6. It's called the Passion Translation. I, I, I got to warn y'all, I found a new translation. You know all those translations. I got a new one. All right? So, but it, I just like, it told it more like in a story, which I wanted you guys to get. All right? Um, and it says, uh, and basically, there's a, really, the, the God's glory is told in the heavens. All right? But let's read what it says in the Passion Translation. God's splendor is a tale that is told. Did you know that? And you look out, and that's why we sometimes people say, hey, I feel close to God in nature. Mm -hmm. It's because God made it. Mm -hmm. And he's telling a tale in his creation. Amen. Now, creation's not God. But God made it. And there, that is why our spirit resonates with that. His testament is written in the stars, and that's another story for another day, but you can actually read the gospel story in the stars. The, um, what we call astrology and all of that, that is actually twisted by Satan, and it is not true. That is not um, actually of God. And it, Satan tends to, he takes a little bit of truth, right, and twists it. Mm -hmm. So he puts that astrology there and kind of twists it. But if you go back, you find that actually all those things that they saw tell the gospel story. Mm -hmm. All right, I have to show you that not through astrology, through God himself, through the stars, okay? Mm -hmm. And Satan took it. Um, his truth is, is on tour in the starry vault of the sky. His truth, his truth, because God is true. Showing his skill in creation's craftsmanship. How creative was he, right? He made you. Hey, Richard, he made you. He's got awesome, because he wanted you. Right? Diana, where's your one? Diana, where are you? Gailey. God made you, because he loved you. You. Amen. He wanted Kaylee to look like Kaylee. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. All right. And each day gushes out its message to the next. Night with night, whispering its knowledge to all. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. All right. We've forgotten how to reach God and see God in all of our things because we don't open up our eyes. We just see it in a natural point of view. We see it from a, just a regular point of view, but open up our spiritual eyes and see God revealed. Amen. Without a sound, without a word, without a voice being heard, 
Yet all the world can see its story. Everywhere its gospel is clearly read, so all may know. What a heavenly home God has set for the sun, shining in the superdome of the sky. See how he leaves the celestial chamber each morning, radiant as a bridegroom ready for his wedding. Amen? Like a day-breaking champion, eager to run his course. And by the way, just a side note here, but if you need a bridegroom, Jesus is your bridegroom, and he loves you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Like a day-breaking champion, eager to run his course. He rises on one horizon, completing a circuit on the other, warming lives and lands with his heat. God is so awesome that he has planted his story in all of creation Amen. so that he can reveal his majesty and his might and his love. Do you know he made it be our world beautiful because he wanted to bless us? We could live in a black and white world. It could have been well, they're all rocky, but it could have just been rock and plain and just like the moon, right? But instead, we have mountains and oceans and rivers and streams and forests and plains. Amen? Amen. <laughs> because he declares his majesty. We have flowers and trees and animals. Because he wants to bless us. And then he made us our crowning, his crowning creation because he wanted to see all the varieties. And I look out here and I see the variety of people and I believe that that makes God glad because he likes every shade of color. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? He likes tall and short and wide and strong and skinny, right? <laughs> Old and young. It doesn't matter. He loves his people. And people need to know that they're loved by God. And let's go to the next scripture for me. And again, the Passion Translation, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Did you know that if you believe in Jesus, if you've accepted him as your Savior, that you have died and been resurrected with him? Amen. Amen. Right? All our sins were paid for and nailed on that cross. That's why we have baptism, to symbolize dying and rising up a new creation. So if you've accepted him today, you could be a new, you are a new creation, sorry. And if you've not accepted him, you can be. You want to be new? Accept Jesus. Oops. Okay? All right, where was I? This is why we all, to, we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tide of this life and now your true life is hidden away in God and Christ. Because here's one thing. Now, the Egyptians got it wrong, right, in the beginning. They messed up, they didn't really, they thought there was hundreds of gods and all this, but they got one thing right. There is an afterlife. There is more to this life than there is. And they put all of their thoughts and their energy in that. And I believe it's one of the reasons that God reached out to Egypt first. Because he knew that there was a yearning. Right? And so we need to put our focus not so much on this life. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. The Egyptians focused on the afterlife and missed the regular life, right? Because they, they missed Jesus, right? So they missed. We look around us. All of our efforts, we don't put them in pyramids. We put them in homes mm -hmm. and possessions and cars. And there's nothing wrong with having possessions. So hear me. It's all right. You can have a nice car. God's still going to love you, right? In fact, I'm going to say God probably wants to bless you with one, all right? But we put all of our energy and our thought into this life, and we forget that there's a next life, and then we too miss it. And we're just like the Egyptians. We've just gone the other way. Yeah. What we need is to mold the two. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, because here's the thing. 
We are not citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven. And we are meant to live on a spiritual plane. And just like Pastor Martin shared earlier today, he said, we need, we need to see with our spiritual eyes. We're not open to spiritual things, right? And we need to be open to miracles and to the Holy Spirit and to, to spiritual things in this life, not just the natural things in this world. And it's okay. We all have a job. We all have families. There's all stuff that we have to do. It's okay. But don't lose hope and don't lose um, focus that there is more. And we have to open up our eyes and see the supernatural, even in the natural. Amen. It was naturally speaking that Egyptians came across our path, but it was supernatural because God wants to reach those people. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen? Amen. As we go about, as we go to our job, it is natural that we have to work and we, and we earn money to, to, for our family, right? Yes. But it is supernatural because God said that we work for Him, do all yes. for God's glory. And do you do know we need more people that believe that they are full-time ministry in the job that they have. Hallelujah. As I told you, my friend that was a nurse, you know what? She never was licensed as a pastor. She never, she wasn't even a leader in her church. Now, she was a leader, but I mean, she wasn't like an official leadership capacity at all in her church. But let me tell you that there are hundreds of people today in heaven because of her ministry at her job. She knew that she was being Jesus in hospice. How would our world change if the police officers were being police officers for Jesus? Now, by the way, I mean, they're doing a great work trying to help humanity, but what if it was, I'm doing this for Jesus? What would our life look like if our teachers were teachers for Jesus? If our businesses were businesses for Jesus? Did you know that God can be glorified in architecture? Yeah. He can be glorified in a business meeting. He can be glorified when you're serving people at a restaurant. And he can be glorified when you're shoveling the muck or you're picking up garbage. Because there is spiritual things to the natural. But we fail to see them because we're so focused on here, we do not look ahead at the life that is to come. So we have to remember that there is more to this life, that we are moving forward, and that we're going to be in heaven a lot longer than we are on this earth. So I'm going to tell you right now, if you're struggling in your life, I don't want to minimize your pain because it is hard. Yeah. It is hard. If you need prayer, you come see me and I will pray for you. You come see us, any of us. Come see us. We will pray with you. We will believe with you. We will stand with you. I don't want to minimize that. But don't lose hope. Because if nothing ever changes spiritual things, God wants to do some of those things now. Amen. Let me rephrase that. God wants to do all of those things Hallelujah. now. I know people, I've been people, marriages I've seen <coughs> saved, people healed from disease, finances restored. God is our hope. Amen. Open up your eyes and see God. The one thing the Egyptians did right is they recognized there was a spiritual force and that there was another life coming. Let's not let them, the Egyptians beat us. We have the truth and the living God. We know the true God. We have him. We have his words. Let's share them. Let's live them. And let's open up our eyes. Amen? Amen. Um, Luke, the next one. Luke 19, 13, and I use the King James Version just because it was a familiar scripture to me. See, I'm all over the place. Uh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that was, I did. But as I did that, I'm like, my mother's going to be so happy. <laughs> She's English. It's, it sounds English. <laughs> She's so happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And it's the peril of the talents. 
Um, other translations says, do business until I come. So I just told you, live for the future, right? But there's a tension. He says, occupy till I come. Because what other people have done, and I've seen, uh, you know, I don't know if every once in a while we hear that God's coming back, and he is. Jesus is coming back. But people that, well, since Jesus is coming back, I'm going to charge up my credit card. <laughs> I'm not going to say, I'm going to spend whatever I like. And guess what? They found themselves in trouble. <laughs> okay, so God told us to be wise. I'm not telling y'all to go quit your jobs, right? Because you need to focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus while you're at the job. See Jesus move while you're at the job. Be Jesus in that smile. Let people see Jesus in you even if you don't open up your mouth. And then invite them to church, to connect group, to your house for coffee. And say, I'm going to tell you about my Jesus. Let them know. All right? So we are still supposed to occupy. There is work here to be done. He wants every person saved on the planet. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's not go the other way as well. Um, and then I'm going to tell you that, that then how do we do that? How do we get that tension? Right? Well, let me tell you what you need is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, you'd like that. All right. We need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is going to guide us into all truth. Let me read that scripture. It's uh, John 14, 26. Um, if you can go to the next one, I think. Actually, I might have, did I skip something in the middle there, honey? Or is it good? But um, when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, yes. he will teach you everything, and I will remind you of everything I have told you. Hallelujah. God will help you. If you wake up every morning and say, God, oh God, help me to do your will today. Give me my priorities today. Help me see you today and everywhere I go. Show me the people that need you. Bring me the people that are hungry so that I can be a witness to them. You do that, God is gonna be with you. Okay. Now I have a video and I'm gonna warn you right now, it's long and forgive me, we'll be done at 11.30, but it's gonna be a little bit longer because I wanna show you this video and it's longer than I would normally have. But I believe that it is important because it shows, it's a story about what Foursquare has done in Egypt. It was about a man that went because here's what happens. The world changes because somebody gets a burning in their Hallelujah. soul. Hallelujah. Praise God. Preach it. That's us. They see a need and they That's go, I'm going to meet that need. Every one of us. Yes. And every one of us can do that. Amen. You can all see a need. So I believe it's important. And he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. So let's roll. Amen. on a hot, uh, sunny afternoon, which is any afternoon in Egypt, and we were coming out of a restaurant. We had been visiting uh, churches and believers, and we were there with some partner ministries and visiting local church pastors there in Egypt, and, and we were walking out of a restaurant, and we're coming down, heading towards the car, and just talking, and a, a, a group of street children approached us. They were a group of young girls, about five, six years old. And they came up, and, and having been a guy who traveled a little bit, I, I figured they were uh, going to be asking for money. And uh, the, the little girls come bounding up, and they hold their hands out. And I love little hobbits. They're all cute. And, and I, I look down, and any time, it's, it's little kids. I, I, I go, do you take Amex? I just take my money. And, and, and I go to my wallet, because I'm going to give them some money. And, and my host looks at me and is like, oh. And I was like, that seems a little mean. <laughs> um, but you live here, I don't. I'm going to submit and I'm going to obey that you know what's going on. And so I said, I'm so sorry, and I started moving to my car. And the little girl grabbed my arm, she's five, six years old, grabs my arm, and I turn back and I look at her, and she's looking up, with, up at me with this very strange, piercing gaze. 
and she begins pouting her lips. <laughs> and I, I had, it didn't, it didn't even cross my mind what was actually happening. I just thought, it's a weird look that I've never seen before on a five-year-old. And so I continued to move and I looked back uh, because she was now pulling on my jacket sleeve real hard. And I, I looked back and I said, oh, I've got to go. And as I looked back to say, I've got to go, she began to undress herself on broad daylight in the middle of the street. And the six or eight young girls who were with her all began to undress themselves on the street. And I, I looked around and I said, somebody else has got to see me. I can't, this, this is terrible. And I look off in the distance and about two, three hundred yards away, I see a middle-aged man intently watching over the whole situation like a ring rates from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and I'm just furious. And my host says, get in the car now. And I get in the car and I'm sitting there and I'm stunned and I'm angry and I feel dirty and I'm just mad and I'm talking to God and it's not pleasant. And, and, and I ask him, I have, we, have, we have to do something. We have to do something. And I don't know what to do. And I'm rarely a person who doesn't have at least some idea of something to do. And I was completely without idea. And I just heard the simple words back to me that said, teddy bears. And I thought, teddy bears? <laughs> no, that cannot be the Lord. <laughs> um, and, I, and, I, and again, I heard it. I heard, teddy bears. And so we pull up to a light, and, and the kids are coming up. And because we won't roll down the windows, they start screaming at us, what I assume were Arabic um, sayings of friendship and blessing. Uh, and the car goes again, and they're literally moving kids out of the way with just the slow idle of the car to get going again. And, I'm, and again, I hear teddy bears. And I said, okay, Lord, if this is you, I think it's silly. And then I realized who I was talking to. And I said, I'm sorry. And I said, so what do we do? What do we do? Are we how does, how does teddy bears help childhood prostitution? And I heard audibly from the Lord in that moment, I love that little girl, and she's my daughter, and if I say she needs a teddy bear, will you be obedient? <sighs> yes, <laughs> I will be obedient. But do we ship teddy bears? What do we do? I go to sleep, I get up, the Lord says, you're gonna print pictures of teddy bears, and on the inside it's going to talk about a love that doesn't need anything from them. You're going to, it's going to talk about a love that doesn't hurt their bodies, that isn't uh, transactional. And he goes, because we can't talk about the gospel, we can't be open about who Jesus is and what he does, but we can simply say, there is a love, it's bigger and better than anything you've ever experienced. So I said, okay, there's probably several hundred of these kinds of children throughout Cairo. And so I, I meet with our host and he says, because of the Arab Spring, there are 3.5 million children under the age of 10 who have been cast out of their homes because of hunger um, and, and lack of basic services. So there's 3.5 million children in Cairo who are homeless. And I went, we got to start printing money at the press. That's what we got to do. And the Lord says, no, just be obedient. So I go to our, our host and I say, okay, is this even going to work? How's it? He says, if we don't talk about the gospel and we talk about where they can find out more about it, we can get them to our churches around the city of Cairo. I said, okay. So we go home, we, 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 we print the, the, the card and it's got a teddy bear and it's written in the right kind of Arabic and it, and it looks appropriate and we ship it back and everything, all the security goes up and he says, let's get them to one place and let's... Let's share the gospel in one place. And it's got to be a hall that we can rent so that we can leave it and there can't be a real whole trace on this whole deal. And so we said, okay, so the press mobilizes, we get going, the, the cards get printed, they're shipped over there. Miracle after miracle happened and I get a little team of people who are willing to go into Egypt uh, right after the news of some executions that had taken place at the pyramids comes out. And I said, you guys still want to go? And so we load up, we get on a plane, we land in Egypt, and they come up to us, and our host greet us. He said, we're so excited. The response has been amazing. I said, I thought we were getting ready to pass out the cards. He said, no, we've been canvassing for weeks, passing out these cards. We've got the date. We need a bigger hall, so we need more money. And I was like, okay, I'll have to figure that out. <laughs> and so I called Bob and asked for more money. Um, <laughs> Bob, the kids need more money, you gonna say no? 
He did not. We had a bigger hall. The game was on. We're going to do a full-on children's gospel box rally in Egypt in the middle of a Muslim neighborhood, and we're going to share the love of Jesus. Hundreds of thousands of these cards have gone out. They've never done anything for kids before, ever in the history of the country, because children are seen and not heard, and it's just not culturally what they thought of. But the Lord thought of them. And so all the churches begin to come together, and where they've been secretive and divided and, and, and set apart, even the Coptic churches begin to come together, and this huge event takes place, and they come by the thousands. The orphanages hear about it. The secular and the Muslim orphanages hear about it and say, we'll wash them. We'll give them fresh clothes, we'll cut their hair, we'll comb the lice out of them, and we'll feed them, and then we'll get them to this place. So they came, and this happened. He gives 
gives us wisdom. And he gives us strategy. But it's all useless without his presence. Yeah. But he gives us that too. Because he wants to bring his presence to every person. Including the little ones. That people don't think are important. And I want to be a church that sees the unseen. I want to be a church that is so filled with the presence of God that when I come in contact with people, they can't help but see and know. I want to have God's wisdom as I come across people so that I will know what will reach them, even if it seems silly. And I want to remind you all that we're in Irving. Do you know all the nations are here? All the nations are here. There's not one missing. I haven't come up with one that I haven't found a representation for in Irving. They are all here because God in his mercy is bringing people where it is legal to preach the gospel. Amen. And we can reach people here as well. And we can pray for those that are reaching them there. And Foursquare this year is doing a huge reach out to North Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia because they want to go where the gospel is hard to be preached. Because they see a need. And they have asked us to pray this next year, especially for North Africa. But that whole region, they are making a huge push. And we're going to be praying, right? Because we want to see Jesus glorified. Amen. 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 I'm go to the next slide. This last slide, and I'm done, I promise, guys. <laughs> Acts 1 8, the Passion Translation. But I promise you this the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you'll be filled with power, and you will be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on earth. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. So we're going to be praying. We're going to move into it. We're going to be teaching you about the Holy Spirit. Because we, the Holy Spirit will give us power. Hallelujah. So that he will give us the wisdom. And he'll give us the power and the strength. Amen. To reach the people around us. The, all the things. The Jerusalem, Judea, the distant provinces. Even to the remotest parts of the <coughs> earth. Because I believe that God has called this church. Amen. To spread the good news. Amen. Here in Irving here in the Metroplex, here in Texas, and all around the world. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? Can we stand and pray? Lord, as we pray, as we sang today, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Lord, we know that you're already here, that if we are saved, you are within us and you dwell within us. But Lord, we call upon you and we ask for a greater outpouring of your spirit, that you would help us to open up our hearts, Lord, and open up our um, our souls and our minds to you, Lord Jesus. You would open up our ears and our eyes that we might see you, that we might be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that we might hear you, and that when you say teddy bear, we'll say, what do you mean, God? And show us what you mean. And it might not be teddy bears here. It may be something else, but Lord, give us insight and wisdom in the name of Jesus. Help us to be a church that sees the unseen. And we ask that you would come and you would fill this place where we cannot go without your presence. We need you. And Lord, though you are here, we welcome you. And we don't hold you back. We say, Lord, come. Come, Jesus. Fill us in the name of Jesus with your power and your might. But most of all, with your love. Because without love, we are nothing. Open our eyes and our hearts. Let us see people the way that you see people. Let us be let us see people's pain so that we can minister life. 